Great to see you all here this evening um, for the launch of Dialogues on Art and Public Speaker Series, which is a new initiative that we have organized um, at SFU Galleries with the City of Vancouver's Public Art Program. My name is Melanie O'Brien, and I'm the director and curator of SFU Galleries, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land that we occupy here in Vancouver as unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Acknowledging that our artistic and academic urban activities unfold on colonized indigenous territories is a recognition that settler colonial, colonialism is an ongoing structure, and it's also a commitment that we have to arts capacity to unsettle these conditions and introduce new questions into our lived experience. Tonight, in welcoming Maria Teresa Alves as our inaugural speaker, we have the opportunity to consider the work of an artist whose practice critically engages the notion of public a concern that will link tonight's event and future talks in the series. Rather than generalizing um, and defining the terms of public art, this series, Dialogues on Art and Publics, will explore the different ways that artists can navigate the tensions of a universal public. If the official public sphere has historically been constituted by exclusion, then where does a city's or a gallery's um, so-called publicness reside? Oriented towards artistic practices whose gestures unsettle dominant spatial practices, dialogues on art and publics will consider diverse production and presentation modes from the site specific to the diffuse. In particular, the series will consider how artists negotiate meaningful action within the constraints of settler colonial structures and what space art can occupy within this kind of unchecked growth um, that, transforms, that can transform these foundational conditions. And given that Vancouver is located on unceded land, it is necessary to interrogate what it means to occupy this land today and to consider, it, consider how we might occupy it otherwise in the future. These possibilities are supported through artistic endeavors, rooting themselves in our practices of assembly and engagement here today. And future talks will take place in the spring of 2020, and we've just confirmed that Ken Lum and Paul Farber will be speaking um, at SFU on April 24th. So stay tuned for future announcements. Um, and another note is just that uh, Maria Teresa Alves has her book here available for sale, Recipes for Survival. It can be purchased back there, and it's also at the Vancouver Art Book Fair this weekend. Um, so now I'm pleased to invite Tatiana Melema. Public art, uh, sorry, public art planner at the city of Vancouver, and our collaborator, who's going to introduce Maria Teresa Alves. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming this evening. Um, as Melanie mentioned, I am Tatiana Melema, and I work with the city as the public art planner. And um, working in collaboration with SFU Galleries on this dialogues and on art and public so has been a really important opportunity for us. Um, and we're looking forward to really critically examining our own commissioning policies and practices and really responding to how artists are working in Vancouver today. And it is my pleasure to introduce Maria Teresa Alves this evening. She's as, as the inaugural speaker. So, and her visit is also supported by the O'Dane Visual Artist in Residence Program at SFU and also the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery where she's been participating in the Spill, um, spill Response um, Program. So Al Alves was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil and has exhibited internationally since the 1980s creating a body of work investigating the circumstances of particular localities to give witness to silenced histories. Her projects are research-based and develop out of her interactions with the physical and, and social environments of the places she lives and also visits for exhibitions and residencies. Responding to local needs and proceeding through a process of dialogue facilitated by direct involvement with material, environmental, and social circumstances, Alves creates spaces of agency and visibility through relational practices of collaboration. So Alves's work, Alves's work has been recently seen in many international exhibitions, uh, among them um, just this past month actually uh, at the Toronto Biennial of Art, as well as at Manifesta, the Sharjah Art Biennial, the Sao Paulo Biennial, the Moscow Biennial, the Berlin Biennial, and Documenta 13, among many others. Um, her ongoing project, Seeds of Change, has been awarded the Vera List Center Prize for Art and Politics, and also, as uh, Melanie mentioned, her book, Recipes for Survival, that was published in 2018, which is here this evening, presents a, seri a sort of searing photo documentary of life in so southern Brazil. Uh, we are really interested in having Elvis speak with us today as part of this series about her strategies for working as an artist within the mandate of communities that she's not necessarily a part of. 
and about her interest in what happens after the artist leaves. So what happens to the relationships built to support the production of the works, what happens to the publics that coalesce around these projects, and to the institutions that continue to facilitate these encounters. So I look forward to this uh, talk this evening, and please join me in welcoming Maria Teresa Alves. Thanks everyone for coming and um, spending your Friday for one hour and a half with me. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about two works. Um, one is called The Full Void, and the other one is called Decolonize, Decolonizing Brazil, and they all, one meshed into the other. So, okay. Um, a Full Void was commissioned by Frestis Triennale. It was called Between Post-Truths and Events in 2017 in Sorocaba in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and it was curated by Daniela Labra. Uh, it's a city I would never go to uh, unless I um, thought the uh, curator was interesting. Uh, I, I would never do a triennale in Sorocaba. I would not spend a week in Sorocaba. Um, it is a, a city that is built on um, um, technological wealth. Uh, it is a very rich city. And uh, it, it originally was uh, cotton wealth. It was called the Manchester of Brazil. Um, and so I was invited to make a new work. It was commissioned, and um, Daniela likes my work very much, respects it, and so there was a very good budget to do it. And um, it turned out I had an, one of the most amazing production teams I've ever been able to work with in my life. So um, now say, go to Sorocaba, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Okay, so Sorocaba is a city located in the state of Sao Paulo, and it was founded by a banderanchi. And it's a bit different than the makeup in the U.S. and um, Canada. Um, their principal activities were enslaving indigenous peoples, followed by the ensuing genocide of indigenous people as a result of the usurpation of lands and resources. Uh, and these killers uh, are celebrated in Brazil as heroes and have, a, and have a national holiday in their honor, November the 11th, it's coming up. Uh, universities, highways, hospitals, flower shops are named after them. In the hotel I stayed uh, at during my research, the meeting room was named in their honor. Yeah. Sala Bandiranchi. My morning coffee uh, was uh, ha has, you can't quite see, oh yeah, maybe you can. This is their Borba Gato. That's a banderanche. Okay. Um, so the long-term presence of indigenous peoples in the history of the city is relegated to a few pots, funerary urns, and ceramic shards of some distant past. The only remains of much that was destroyed as a result of the invasion. These are displayed in the city museum, which is housed in the local zoo. Okay. Uh, this is a painting. On the right, yeah, you can see it, okay. Uh, I wasn't allowed to take photographs in the museum, so I was doing everything very quickly. Um, so this painting is uh, of the founding myth. Uh, these pots here have very little information on the museum labels. There's no interest in, this, in the city to study this history. So um, that's how I began, is how does the city see themselves? So we have here the founder, is that guy there? And uh, and the scene and you and you can't quite see it, but he has that one a big whip. I think maybe he has two whips, a short one and a big one. My grandmother used to have that. Um, and so I was interested in that. And then I said, okay, now I want to visit where the historical, political, social, and economic lives of the city takes place. So uh, okay. So I went to the piazza, the central piazza and um, which was pretty gruesome. So we have the, the, uh, a monument, a statue of the founding father killer. And then we have over there, so he's here, and over there, which is over here in the piazza, is a plaque to the father of modern Brazilian historical scholarship, Mr. Van Hagen. And um, 
we will talk about him much later, a lot about him much later. Okay. Then, um, okay. And then here we have the piazza, which is uh, in honor of the founder of the military police of the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, and there we have the uh, justice building, a court justice. And here we have the shopping mall. It used to be this area was all these huge stones. All of, this is all that, that one stone remains. Okay. So I then thought it would be important that ceramic pots be placed on these sites because they, the only thing we have is ceramic pots. It's, it, there's nothing else that is there that is testimony. So I first spoke with the Guarani community in Sao Paulo, as Sorocaba is a city in Sao Paulo state, to see uh, who might make some. There are no indigenous ceramicists in Sao Paulo although there are several accomplished basketry makers. I then spoke with Maximino Rodriguez, a Guarani, a teacher and a leader from the Jaguar Peru Reservation in Dourados in the state over Mato Grosso do Sul. Uh, there was no one there who made ceramics either, but he offered to learn and make them. He began his research by interviewing the elders of the reservation. He explained that many wept as they remembered the traditional ceramic making process that made up part of their cultural patrimony which, which is no longer practice. The main economic activity of Sao Paulo during its first 200 years was the direct sale of enslaved indigenous people. There is this myth about the coffee. That's a myth that came afterwards. Um, the money to make that came from the uh, uh, sale of enslaved indigenous people. And uh, people were captured from the Atlantic coast all the way to the frontier with uh, Argentina and Paraguay and then even further north. So entire communities, were conf uh, when confronted with these ass assaults, would flee. Uh, anything that was heavy was left behind. So after hundreds of years of this fleeing, little effort was spent on making objects which cannot be easily carried, and thus ceramics ceased to be manufactured eventually. Rodriguez saw the bringing back of the art of ceramic making as an act of resistance. He taught himself with the help of elders to find the appropriate, appropriate clay, dig it up, clean it, then make the ceramics and finally fire them. The ceramic elements the public saw in Suracaba were the result of this revitalization of Guarani culture. These ceramics made by Rodriguez were then placed semi-buried in these public spaces throughout the city, parking lots, shopping centers, and parks, sidewalks, and the university. The work was an attempt to question the denial of the indigenous presence and the history of the making of Suracaba. And then we go to the map. So there's this map with the, I didn't choose all the historical places because I try to keep it within walking distance. Um, I could have gone further north and, but I said I wanted to do it so that you could do everything in about an, an hour, an hour and a half. So that's what, what limited the size of the project. Uh, and then in this map it explains um, little pieces of, of, of history that uh, is not included in the official history. So there is, of course, okay. there's a piazza there with um, uh, the banderanchi, and there, okay. So um, I started to put ceramics there. And I would like to say that I asked for uh, permission to be able to put ceramics. At, it's at the foot of his, it's right here actually. Um, and I thought I would not ever get this permission from the city founding fathers, uh, descendants. Um, but the production manager, who is an amazing person, uh, she had a, she's doing, she was doing the whole Biennale, and she had a huge amount of stuff that the city had to sign, that the mayor had to sign, the secretary of culture. And she just stuffed it in there among uh, many other things. And then we had permission to do it. I was completely. So this monument is dedicated to Baltazar Fernandez, an Indian killer, Banderanchi, slaver who stands in front of the monastery to which he gave lands and enslaved indigenous peoples for its foundations. There once was an indigenous village between this and monastery and the cathedral further down. Um, he arrived in this area with 400 enslaved people to make the city. Then we have this uh, cemetery, which is just open. It's like a park. Uh, it's an indigenous cemetery. Uh, no archaeological work was carried out. I found out about it during the installation uh, near the monument to the uh, founder killer. When a technician that was working on, on my project went to speak with the worker in the local church, 
who said that there had been some uh, skeletons dug up when they were doing a little bit of renovation work. So here I put um, some ceramic shards in that area. Here is the former uh, Court of Justice. This was the cathedral was a bit difficult because there was not much uh, place I could dig up. So um, there was just a little bit of a corridor there that you see next to the cathedral and I had to work with that. Uh, and this is the piazza dedicated to the founder of the military uh, police of the state. Uh, it has a splendid view of the Sorocaba River, which was a gateway used by these killers to leave on expeditions to go to the interior of the country to capture yet more people to be made into slaves. Uh, this is a park uh, of, in a very wealthy part of the city, but it's near where uh, the venue was, so um, I worked with it. This is a bike lane. It's right in front of the most prestigious uh, grammar school in the city. And so then it, I was hoping that by doing this, because the venue was right across the road from here, uh, that the education program can then talk to these uh, teachers about bringing the students over. And you have the students who are connected to the elite of the area. And my idea is that maybe something might help make the situation interesting in 20 years if they learn about something. All right. And this place here was um, very special. Uh, there was only one reference to an indigenous person in recent years uh, in the history of the, of the city, and it was to a young, about a young Guarani boy, uh, Joaquin Augusto Martin, who was interned in the Bethel Orphanage, and this is the orf part of the orphanage building, uh, due to medical problems. As a young man, he worked in the orphanage as a gardener, and he studied medicine for two years, and later he was able to find his family again. He would become the founder of the Guarani Reservation Tecoa Yotu in Sao Paulo, which is the smallest demarcated reservation in Brazil. His daughter, Eunice Augusto Martin, she's a nurse. She's the founder of the Tecoa Pau Reservation nearby. And his granddaughter, Poteporanturiba Carlos, is a school teacher married to the brother of the founder of the Tecoa Calapete Reservation, Gera Lima de Pires. An amazing family, no? Uh, this is a chapel. It's called the Chapel of the Good uh, Man, of the Good uh, God, or something like that. Um, and it's uh, founded by João de Camargo. He was a, an enslaved African. Uh, he was imprisoned 18 times for practicing shamanism. And then somebody said, "Well, perhaps if you make a chapel, and then it's, you say it's religious, they can't um, put you in prison again." So then that's what he did. He did this chapel, and much of the iconography of the chapel is of indigenous people. So it's, uh, it's a really amazing little um, history there. Uh, I placed uh, vases there in the garden. They have a very small little garden. And then the community asked for me not to take it away after the exhibit finished. Other places, uh, the, the ceramics were taken away, but not here. Uh, this is from a I can't read it that far out, but anyway, it's a plaque that um, talks about liberty and democracy and all of that. It's in front of the railroad tracks. I put shards there because it was very difficult to dig. Uh, this is the Museum of Contemporary Art, which is on the grounds of the railroad museum, uh, on the grounds of the railroad offices. This is the railroad museum and had been formerly offices. Uh, the railroad company was created for the sole purpose of transporting cotton and coffee picked by enslaved Africans. The expansion of the railroad uh, line would result in extermination campaigns against indigenous peoples whose lands the railroad usurped. So um, I'd like to go back to the making of the ceramics because this caused um, a, a very interesting problem for me uh, to try to figure out how to deal with. Um, so. First, there was, uh, as there were no ceramicists, uh, as a result of colonization in Sao Paulo, I requested that SESCI, who was funding the Triennale, and it's an amazing organization, 
I forgot what it stands for, but it's um, a type of union of all people who work in commerce. So if you sell bubblegum, you're in this union. And if you sell Maseratis, you're in this union. It's one union. Uh, and you, and a, a small amount of money goes into making a SESCI, which is like a cultural center. And um, they're, they've um, tried to figure out what the community needs. And in this SESCI, for example, there's a dentist office because the health um, insurance normally doesn't cover dentistry. So then you have that there. Um, they have a swimming pool, they have a gym and everything. Those are for only for union members. But then they have a public programs and their public programs are usually very good. So um, I asked uh, Sesky to finance a workshop to be given by Michelle Vargas and Maximino Rodriguez at the Calapete Reservation at the invitation of Gera Pires de Lima in Sao Paulo. Sesky wanted to know if they were to receive ceramic pieces in exchange. I said that was up to the participants of the workshop, but I did not know. And then Sesky said that they saw no reason to finance the workshop. I explained that that it could be seen as reparation payments, perhaps, because it was part, it, because it was the result of the enslavement practices by the founder of their city that resulted in the lack of Guarani ceramicists in Sao Paulo. Explained to that way, Sesky agreed. Um, <laughs> then Michele, Max, and Jera, okay, here. Uh, these are images taken, uh, well, that, that one's by Michele, and, um, of the whole process. I mean, uh, they are amazing. I've been, lear I've been learning ceramics and I started out with something small. Here, Michelle and Max, I mean, they already went through the, to the big. And I'm, re I'm really impressed and they made amazing things um, in one month. They learned and they, they just did it. Okay, so um, I will show you images that they took. Um, this is finding the, um, the, the clay. Uh, and so they requested, Jera, Max, and Michelle, they all requested that images of the workshop be included in the exhibit. And now this posed me a big problem because to me that would be ethnographic um, use of the indigenous person. And um, within the context of Brazil, where it's extremely problematic, I, I had a very difficult time with the request. Uh, as an artist, when I work with the community, I really try to uh, fulfill uh, the what, what the community says they need, okay? Um, so I was trying to figure out, okay, how do I do this? Um, part of the problem is that Brazil is so racist that if there is an image of an indigenous person, uh, the spectator will not, or the visitor will not even go near the image, okay? So um, I was like, how can I deal with this situation? Um, so, this is the installation. So here is the image that Max sent. Right? And this is how it was in the installation. So what I did was uh, I had it printed on metal. So when you're, wait a minute, sorry, went in the wrong direction. So when you're far away, you're seeing these uh, reflections and you don't know what, quite, quite what it is and it brings you in and then my dis my thing was, how do I seduce the spectator to come into this space here? Uh, so I, I worked with these images that are very uh, shiny and people are a little bit confused about what it might be. Some of the images were inverted. I think uh, I did that for the pots because they worked actually much better when they were inverted uh, because of the tones. Um, so then this worked because then people came very close and then they were curious about the images and then I had them. <laughs> okay. Okay, the next element was a workshop that would result in the making of a short video interviews that you can see the little uh, small monitors there with the headphones. Uh, this was a result of a three-day workshop with indigenous students in the bachelor program of UFSCAR, the Federal University of San Carlos. And this was part of the work process. Um, during the first day, we read, uh, I had all of this translated into Portuguese, right? Uh, we read texts by indigenous intellectuals such as Linda Tuhui Way Smith, Richard Hill, Candace Hopkins, Joy Harjo, Jared McMasters, Simon Ortiz, Vine Deloria, among others. On the second day, we looked at the works of artists such as Rebecca Belmore, Ruth Cuthan, Edward Poitras, Nicholas Galalin, Jimmy Durham, 
Minerva Cuevas, Abraham Cruz Viegas, Mike Kai Tubbs, Shelley Nero, Jeffrey Gibson, Edgar Hippobirds, Kent Monkman, Daniel Guzman, Francisco Toledo, Cisco Jimenez, among others. The students were frustrated that the texts by indigenous intellectuals from Brazil were not included. The study guide was designed exactly with this in mind, to bring the attention to the lack of publication by indigenous intellectuals in Brazil due to the policy of exclusion based on colonialism. And thus, no indigenous intellectual is publicly acknowledged in their fields, as would be the case in Canada, Mexico, US, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, indigenous writers in Brazil explain that they are usually relegated to writing only children's books. If you want to write them, fine, but if that's your only option, that's something else. Uh, in Brazil, indigenous intellectuals are not invited to speak, write, or participate in activities that are not concerning indigenous issues. This being, begins to change very slowly due to pressure from the indigenous community. The participants in the workshop would be asked to interview their non-indigenous colleagues on campus about which issues are important to indigenous students at UFSCar. Their videotaped interviews was exhibited in the installation. This time the images were only of the non-indigenous students who were interviewed because then we have, I was trying to deal with the idea of in the Brazilian situation, uh, it is always a non-indigenous person with the mic in front of the indigenous person. So I wanted to um, go away from that. Um, the students um, uh, made a list of questions they wanted to ask. So what did, um, they asked this, uh, their colleagues, what did they learn about indigenous peoples in school? What contributions are made by indigenous peoples? Have they ever met an indigenous person or visited a reservation? Were they aware that there were indigenous students at UFSCar? One black uh, student answered that there had been no contributions made by indigenous peoples. Colonization is a process that makes us, those who have been colonized, wounded internally, and we must therefore also struggle very hard to decolonize ourselves. And there has been consistently, um, until very recently, uh, uh, no link between uh, the black movement and the indigenous movement. Um, so and then something that's happening very recently. Uh, the students, also asked that there be uh, ceramics installed in the university campus to bring more visibility to the indigenous community. The students chose areas where there was much activity, such as the library, the cafeteria, the buildings which house the indigenous students association, and the main roundabout at the entrance of the campus. The last element of this work was uh, two talks given by Eunice Augusto Martin and her daughter Potipora Anturibu Carlo from Tecoa Yute Reservation in Sao Paulo. Martin and uh, Poran spoke about contemporary land struggles in the state of Sao Paulo at the plaza where the statue of the killer founder of the city was. And then we continued to walk down towards the end of town at the other plaza where the founder of the military police was located. And it was an attempt to um, visibly reclaim uh, the space of the city uh, that refuses to acknowledge any indigenous people around there. But it was uh, just a very strange timing. Just as we were leaving, this was happening. So this is the monument to the killer. And I don't know if you can, okay, you can see it. This guy is photographing these two guys. These are, uh, pretend cowboys, they're gauchos, but they're, they're like, there's these gaucho clubs and they dress up and then they have uh, the, the big knives and you know they get on a horse once a year. Uh, they go do bonfires and they go out with the tent. And see here, so it's that whole cowboy myth thing, being, right? And they're photographing themselves in front of him. So, and you see what type of people they are looking like, right? Um, then there was the opening, and Maximino sent a letter that he wanted it to be read aloud, and I will quote just a few parts. Uh, it was uh, Dourados, Mato Grosso, uh, September 9th, 2017. Dear Maria Teresa, 
To make the ceramics was a historical act for me, which involved the remembering of beloved Guarani beings, many who have been lost during the century, but who have brought me strength and courage to confront these two moments. First, the concern with the retomada, that is uh, a Portuguese word uh, that means the retaking of the land. Um, and there has been, um, this is um, the most violent state against indigenous people in Brazil. Um, so in the retomada, there is now a land conflict. We were, uh, our reservation was demarcated for 3,600 hectares, but 70 hectares are missing. We have 18,000 people and have a need of this land, which is in the hands of non-indigenous people. And it is now in a hard confrontations, very violent confrontations, uh, where 100 families are retaking these lands, and that's about 600 people, even although we know that that is not sufficient land for us. The settlers support each other and accuse the Guarani of invading. To participate in the struggle brings me sadness as we live moments of pure aggression. We see our youth participating, we see fathers of families being gravely wounded and unable to buy bread for their family in the center of town. Uh, it's that type of very settler racist town where uh, if you go in and uh, are obviously physically indigenous, you will not be able to buy a blanket in the store or bread. So you have to have network systems with uh, non-indigenous people to acquire things in town, like go to the supermarket. So I welcome the opportunity to show the quotidian realities of the past, which happens as a result of the making of these ceramics, and of techniques which are almost forgotten today, but still in the memory of the living elders. This has given me, has given me strength to bring about a cultural center of Guarani memory, which would be a point of reference to indigenous schools and others. At the end of the, let's get away from that stupid, okay. At the end of that project, um, Sesky, the organizers of Sesky uh, said that they liked the work and they liked my approach with the community and that if I ever wanted to do something else, they would support it. Um, so at the same time, at the end of the workshop with the students, they asked for me to return and they said they wanted to write a book about indigenous leaders. Oh, perfect. <laughs> both money and interest at the same time. Right. Uh, it was a year where I had a little fame due to the Vera List Award for Art in Politics, and so I played that card, first time ever. Um, so that was, uh, I learned something. 57 years old, I've learned how to do that. Uh, so I spoke with Sasky and I asked for the support of a new workshop with the students. I then asked the students to make me their wish list of what we wanted to do and materials we needed. We were very uh, modest. We have a book, uh, two video cameras, and we want a uh, publication of language magazines. The producers of the work, these marvelous producers I'm telling you about, um, without asking me, just thought it was too modest and added more things. So um, they added still cameras, sound studio time, speakers, more monitors, several tablets, and a computer. And uh, Sesk requested um, that in exchange for uh, supporting this project that I would make a workshop for non-indigenous local artists as payment. SESC authorized the entire budgetary request. <laughs> um, and we, or the students and I, we were very astounded because we had so much equipment and now we had to figure out what were we going to do with it and we had like two weeks to do it in. Um, and we were a bit like, wow, this is a huge responsibility. Um, and the students were amazing. Okay. So, Decolonizing Brazil was the title of the new uh, workshop and of the, the umbrella of all the work and of the book and, and also the language magazines. And then we would also have audio works because now we had studio time and speakers, which we didn't even think about. Um, and then from all of this also came spontaneous theater works. So the, thing, the project just kind of grew. And these uh, producers had to deal with my requests. They were very modest requests for increasing the budget but they kept coming, you know, uh, and they were really um, quite kind about it. So for the first activity of the workshop, uh, we spent several days in the local countryside, Flona, the National Forest of Ipanema, which, with the use of the labor of enslaved Tupiniquim people, had been an ironworks since the late 16th century until the late 19th century. After the uh, decimation of the Tupiniquins through genocide and slavery, 
by the Portuguese and then the Brazilians. Enslaved Africans provided forced labor until the 19th century when slavery was abolished, although the practice continues today. Up until the present administration, um, the 3,500 enslaved people were freed annually in Brazil, and there was even a, um, a budget to, uh, of reparations to give. All of that is gone with the new president. Um, who is also trying, I don't know, I think he passed it or is trying to pass it, that uh, under the previous administration, if you are not paid, it's considered slavery. And under the new administration, they say, if you receive food and a place to sleep, it's payment. Um, okay. Uh, so now we get back to the father of modern Brazilian historical scholarship. And I am going to repeat this line all the time. Um, he, his name is Francisco Adolfo de Farnehagen. He was born on, the, uh, on, the build, on this site. Um, and it was his father who built the high temperature ovens and managed the ironworks. Farnehagen, the son, uh, had extremely racist viewpoints against indigenous people and Afro-Brazilians as, as a direct result of his upbringing at Fazenda de Ipanema and this state. Um, the father of modern Brazilian historical scholarship supported genocidal colonial wars against indigenous people and wrote in the preliminary discourse of 1854, so far from condemning the use of coercion through force to civilize our Indians, we are, persuade, we are persuaded that no other means could have been employed and that we had to do this ourselves for the benefit of peace, which will increase their useful labor in favor of human dignity, which is vexed in the presence of so much degradation, and even to the benefit of these same unfortunates, and that when our cities, when they progress to the condition in which our Africans find themselves, this is in the middle of slavery. This is 1854. Slavery continued for another 34 years, in the middle of slavery. Um, they would live more tranquilly and freer in the city than they live, always horrified in their fearful, fearful freedom in the woods. Thus spoke the father of modern Brazilian historical scholarship. So we began our workshop by making a large cloth um, blanket with our favorite colors. We sat and sewed it together, and then we began to visit Flana and its history. We first came to the iron ovens. This is a ve this very harsh, uh, we thought this was the, one of the worst places on the, that land, but there are more. Uh, where the workers that worked on this part had an average lifespan of 30 years, the enslaved workers. We went to the monument uh, to the father of modern Brazilian historical scholarship. Uh, these are the students who participated. This is a perfect moment. Um, and then we decided that each participant would honor an indigenous activist by writing their name on a cut off piece of the blanket and then that we would place it in Flana. We also negotiated with Flana that they could not take it down, that it would have to be a natural process for it to come off where we put it. Uh, in this uh, manner we would retake or retomar the place symbolically because there was no act of violence um, against us. So, um, I put, minus this pink one up there, uh, I put Tupai, who's a Guanari leader, who was my mentor, who was murdered in 1983 for uh, defending indigenous land in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul. He is from the same reservation that the ceramicist is from. So all the ceramics, so things start to like um, become, uh, it's like stepping on the earth, and the earth is always everything you're part of. Um, Sepe, ti, ti, Sepe Tiaroju is a Guarani who died fighting the Spanish in the 18th century. Guadino Patasha is an activist and leader who arrived in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, on the Day of the Indian to meet with politicians regarding demarcation of his people's land. He was burned alive while there by five young men of the Brazilian elite in the capital. The killers were condemned to prison to 14 years, and they were, unlike any other prisoners, allowed to have keys to their own cells. Uh, and uh, Brazilian uh, regulations uh, requires that 
to apply for parole, you have to be two thirds of the term of your sentence. They were out in less than half. Uh, as I said, they came from the elite to Brazil. This is a case that when it happened, I followed it and I just was so depressed and I knew that they were gonna get away with it and I, I, and I just couldn't keep following it. But because of this, I had to look up the presentation and what I had tried to avoid knowing, I now know. So um, all of Gaudino Patasha's killers are now public employees in Brasilia, one even working for the federal Senate. Ajuricaba uh, is a Manau. He resisted the Portuguese enslavers and died. This is an image by Kagusu Tukuna. It was drawn the first day. The students applied paint to their faces to make their presence public in Florna. All these images are only images that the students took or asked someone to take that was um, organizing of the group. That's one of the things I was very adamant about that um, because the earlier project that I did with the students, uh, they have the Center for Indigenous Cohabitation. That's a bad translation, but okay. Um, and the, uh, the non-indigenous professors kept coming into that space without even knocking on the door and photographing everything they did and, and the students as objects. And I got very angry at that. So I thought that we would begin the workshop and I would make it very clear that no one could ever photograph unless it was a student or unless the student asked for the photograph. Um, and, um, and we changed other practices with that room also. Um, to give the students more space. Um, so the racism was too intense, and so the students did not uh, paint themselves the following days. Um, although there were groups of non-indigenous students with war paint screaming Hollywoodian war whoops, uh, and it was disheartening to see that it is perfectly acceptable to dress up as an Indian, but not to be an indigenous person. This is the area where the enslaved Tupiniquins worked the first ironworks in Brazil. And this is Trilha Tupiniquim, uh, Tupiniquim Path. Um, on the first day, we met uh, with two guides, amazing guides, one of who lives on the site. And they explained that there was a, a group of guides who want to change the name of the local ancient trail from the, that of the first white enslaver to that of the original peoples who had actually made the trail, the Tupiniquins. So we thought we might contribute in making this discussion more public. And I have this image here because I want to talk about, okay. Uh, these are all the students except for the, uh, the guy, the left, the second one from the left and, and me. Right? Um, and I want to relate a story that he told that he thinks it's very important. It's a very harsh story. Um, but to honor him, I will uh, say it. So um, this is the house we were staying in. This would be an administrator's house of the ironworks. And then there was um, the main house, which is this one, which, well, I didn't take the front of it, but anyway, it's, it's a museum. Uh, it honors uh, the father of modern Brazilian historical scholarship. Uh, and Rafael, uh, uh, this guide, uh, he is fourth generation of Flona, fourth. So that means his father, uh, no, his, his great-grandfather, I'm always bad at these things, uh, uh, was probably an enslaved worker on the ironworks. Uh, Raphael is a guide and uh, an environmentalist, and he's part of that group that's trying to change the way things are presented and talked about uh, and to be more inclusive about the history. So he explained, he took us here, um, and this is the back of the house, and it's the, the side. And so you see, there's all these indentations that you see as a little bit of darkness. There's all these indentations. And this is what they are. That's what you're seeing. Um, he explained that during the cold weather, the cavern-like rooms on, on the underground-like, uh, with iron grate below the foundation level, held en uh, enslaved African people. They were whipped in order to keep them moving, and thus their bodies would provide heat for the white families living above. Uh, this story he tells, 
remains, not because it's in an official book, but because it was passed down by his family. They survived the Farnahagans and let us know today what has happened there. Um, and this is where Farnahagen, the father of modern Brazilian historical scholarship, was born. And thus, this is the basis of modernity in Brazil. The ironworks closed and were transferred to the Ministry of War and later the Ministry of Agriculture. And a nuclear reactor was installed in 1980 by the Marines. Well, why not? Uh, in 1992, the estate was declared the National Forest of Ipanema, and uh, they do have an amazing staff, I don't know now, when we did the project, they did, an amazing staff of ecologists attempting to restore as best as can be uh, the Atlantic Forest. But as the head ecologist pointed out to me, the nuclear reactor, he said, we work so hard, and that can be, all of this can be destroyed in a few seconds by that. Um, okay. Uh, the students who participated in the workshop in 2018 speak a total of nine indigenous languages, yet this incredible gift is not celebrated by the university. Instead, they are penalized for not being expert speakers and writers in Portuguese. As there are no indigenous language courses offered at UFSCar, we thought if that we were able to interest non-indigenous students, that this in turn would put pressure on the university to offer these classes. The students produce publications or audio recordings. See, we made use of the studio, sound studio time, uh, in their maternal lang languages. Tikuna, Baniwa, Tuyuka, Kamambeba, Tukano, Waja, Yabamasa, Kariri, and Kuripako. Uh, they are um, all available on the Decolonizing Brazil website along with audio recordings. This is the magazine. There was, um, seven language magazines. The students also met with the Guarani Mamba and, the and their community leaders, Mr. Jose Fernando Suarez, William Macena, and Nilson da Silva from the Guairá Pepó Reservation in Tapiraí, close, a small town close to Sorocaba. This is a new reservation where several families were deposited there by the Brazilian government in the middle of winter. No housing, no food, nothing. Uh, these lands were ha handed over as compensation for the loss of land where they formerly resided due to the construction of a highway. The whole process took, I think, about 20 years. Uh, and the students decided that this history would be part of the project and the website. Okay. Uh, this is part of a photo essay by Kali Tariano of the Daily Racism at the University. Uh, in collective projects at the university, non-indigenous students will most commonly not uh, except an indigenous student to be part of the group. Eating is also a lonesome affair. And the students made a series of videos and theater pieces documenting their daily life and racism they encounter in the university, the hospital, the restaurant. Brazil is a country that does not in any way confront its colonial past or present. Um, and as you can see here, oh, that's that. this is uh, part of Kali's photo essay, but then this is part, uh, one still from the performance that they did of racism in a restaurant. Um, and so they started working with each other to try to um, make it visible. Um, and, and they would do, I think, once they got into it, they were, were like were organizing one theater piece a day, plus everything else that we're doing, writing a book, language magazine, uh, very intense time. We had also been making exercises based on Augusto Boal's Theater of the Oppressed. Um, during the discussions on the book with the students, uh, they asked if an intellectual must have a university degree. As one of the first in my family to attain a university education, I do not see how a university degree and critical thinking are necessarily co-commitment to each other. Uh, the students at UFSCar thought it was imperative to write about intellectuals who are important to them as young thinkers. Indigenous people in Brazil are excluded as protagonists from the official narrative. The primary efforts of indigenous people throughout these over 500 years of colonization is the recognition of the community's lands, which was only recently been guaranteed to two very long struggles by the communities for indigenous rights, which were finally included in the federal constitution of 1988. However, at the best of times, previous administration, 
these rights were ignored and the lands continued to be uh, remain undemarcated, even though within the federal constitution there is a timeline when demarcation was supposed to be completed. And now under the new administration, the worst of times, these lands and communities are under aggressive assault. The president has said he will not demarcate any lands uh, and he is looking into de un undemarcating lands that have been demarcated. So um, the previous administration on their last month demarcated a few reservations uh, that they had not done during the administration because it would bring very much political um, problems to that administration with uh, people they needed uh, uh, support of. So they waited until the last month of the administration to demarcate these lands. So the new president said those lands uh, will not be respected as demarcated. Um, so. Many of the intellectuals chosen by the students do not have published texts, and thus the preferred mode of research was interviews. And the result is a beginning um, of, uh, of a, a, a ebook. We didn't uh, get funding to publish it uh, by um, paper. And it's written by indigenous thinkers of WEFSCAR on indigenous intellectuals. I just go briefly through the chapters because as this is a historical moment to have done this book. Grants to Indigenous Students by Potida Cambeba brings to light the Brazilian government's consistent attempts to withdraw grants, which are in fact reparations to Indigenous students who are in financial need and which enables them to purchase food and supplies. The students must strike for weeks so that the grants are reinstated, in this case, six months, but too late for several students who would not be able to continue with their studies while others lost one semester of education due to the federal government actions. How, how am I doing with time? Um, so um, I would like to add here that the system in Brazil for grants is different from the Canadian. Grants are allotted to one, one grant per discipline, okay? Uh, so many of the students um, are not studying what they are interested or gifted in. Most would like to study education, nursing, or environmental si sciences, but only three can, and there's only three. So others struggle with fields of study that they see as having little or no benefit for their community needs. There was one student who would have been brilliant in theater, in the arts. This university had none of that, and he got accepted in math. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. Uh, there was a great amount of work done to get him out of that university into something else. Uh, chapter two, Rosa, Roseli Batalha Braga by Rayana Atikum writes on a former student leader at the university who is also a community activist in the Amazon and militant about the revival of the Kambeba language. Braga also coordinated, coordinated liaison between indigenous students and com community um, organizations and the powerful institution SPPC, Brazilian Society for the Progress of Science. And she also fought for grants for indigenous students. Braga is as well co-founder of OCA, Organization of the Cambeba of the Alto Solimões region. Chapter three, Marconde Mauricio de Souza by Pochira Cambeba. An Omaga Cambeba student who graduated in microtechnology from UFSCar, founder of the Indigenous Students Movement, co-founder of the Center of Indigenous Cultures in 2012, of the National Meeting of Indigenous Students of 2013, and in 2015, he was one of the first indigenous students elected to the University Council and went on to participate in several events at the UN representing indigenous university students. I'm saying these dates because these dates are important. You see that co-founder of the Center of Indigenous Culture in 2012, the National Meeting of Indigenous Students in 2013. This is because all of uh, the possibilities of going to universities and having funding for indigenous students happened uh, during the previous um, two-term, four-term administration. So that was that moment of about almost 15 years where um, there was uh, a space made in universities for indigenous students. That's, uh, so it's very, all of this is very new and all of this is being destroyed as we speak. Chapter four, Lionel Atikum by Rayana Atikum, studied biological science at the National University of Brasilia. So when we're saying also the field, it is because these are the first students in these fields. 
They're, and they have all the racism to deal with. They have to open up all the spaces in the universities for the next students. Um, so um, there's a lot of pressure on these um, first generation of students at the university. He's a militant activist, youth leader, and participates in organizations such as the Indigenous Youth Network, National Mobilization of Indigenous and Quilombola Students, and APIB, which is the Articulation of Indigenous Peoples of Brazil, among other organizations. Chapter five, Places of Exclusion, photographic essay by Caldi Tariano. Chapter six, I always like to think aloud and differently. I was the perfect person to do this, by Kwagusu Tukuna. He writes on different aspects of the history of his people, the Tikuna. Um, he is the one that was studying math and should have been studying theater. He's now studying literature. That's the closest we could get him to. But we're hoping that bit by bit uh, we find uh, an opening somewhere in some university that he can go through. Uh, in his text, he includes um, the massacre of the Boca Iguarape Capacete, which was committed three, uh, 30 years ago, in which many members of his, families were killed, of his family was killed. The assassins were condemned to only 13 years. He writes also uh, a section on Josiana Tucci Auna. She's a Tukuna leader and the organizer of university students. Chapter seven, David Kapinoa Yanomami by Kali Tariano. He's a renowned Yanomami thinker and shaman. Sonia Guajajara by Potira Kambeba. She was a vice presidential candidate uh, for PSOL party, Socialism and uh, Liberty. Uh, um, Guajajara has worked on several organizations in the Amazon on local and regional scale, such as Coapipa, Co Coibi, and AP APIB. Chapter 9, Maria Miquidina Barreto Machado by Aldini Tucano. It's about her mother, uh, who's a formidable leader of the Tucano people in São Gabriel de Cachoeira, one of the six municipalities in Brazil where there is recognition of an official indigenous language. Municipality, I'm not talking state, municipality, one of six. To put this in perspective, Italian, which is a Venetian dialect, Venetian, is recognized in 13 municipalities. And different German dialects, such as Pomeranian or Plattdeutsch, is, rec is uh, officially recognized in 20 municipalities. The teaching, the teaching of indigenous language is not mandatory in any municipality in Brazil but German is in one and Italian in five. Machado has participated in leadership roles in the Association of Indigenous Women of Alto Rio Negro, coordination of indigenous organizations of the Brazilian Amazon, as well as being a representative at the Climate Change Conference in New York and Quito in 2009. Chapter 10, Indigenous Leaders by Sunya Yamabesha. He writes on Powani Tuyuka and Higienio Tenorio both teachers who defend their culture and indigenous knowledge in Alto Rio Negro, and the long struggle to have indigenous teachers who teach in local languages. He also writes on Justino Sarmento Hezendi, a, a Salesian priest of Tuyuca ethnicity. The Wajá by Kuhupi Wara is about his village and the brilliant ceramics of his mother, Arapó Warura. She's a master ceramicist. Bonifacio José Baniwa by Am Omawalayani Baniwa is a renowned Baniwa leader and activist in many organizations, especially in the Amazon. Irondina de Souza Fermin by Potira Cambeba is the recognized leader of the Amagua Cambeba people in Alto Solimões since 1998. Uh, Fermin finished her university studies while also being a leader of her people uh, in indigenous education in 2015 and authored a book on, uh, for the revitalization of the Kambeba language. And she continues to fight for demarcation rights of the Kambeba territory and for better health care. And the last chapter is on Jakuna Krenak. Um, this thing about, about how when you step out, everything comes together. Um, this chapter is by Rayana Atikun, and it's called The Guardian of Knowledge of Her People. Uh, Jukuna Krenak is an activist and storyteller I w had worked with her in the video Irasema de Kestember, in which she was the main protagonist. Uh, Krenak, along with her two brothers, stopped a train for a few days that has passed through polluting their reservation nonstop for 80 years and, re and removing resources. 
She's a militant for the reactivation of Krenak language for the 2010 Biennale in Sao Paulo. We worked on translating a Krenak German dictionary into Krenak Portuguese. It was a dictionary written in the early 1900s, and um, due to the genocide, um, there are uh, 600 Krenaks living, and much of the language has been destroyed, so this dictionary is very important. She's an act, uh, activist against the contamination of Hugh Dossi in 2015, which is, um, uh, there was an iron trailings dam which collapsed and uh, totally contaminated this river. It's, uh, Hugh Dossi is Sweet River. Um, she, and the book ends with a quote by uh, uh, Jukuna Krenak. I am an indigenous Krenak, I am proud to say. I am the trunk of a tree, I am strong. They cut off all my branches thinking I would die, but the sun and the rain came and gave me life. Um, then the students took the actions that we had begun in Flona. And I want to say also that this idea of cutting the blanket and putting the names on, that came from the driver of the group. We had a very good equip. The equip, um, we spent the whole day always together, the driver, the cook, uh, the production person, we always went together and the driver said, Maria Trace would be a really good idea if you, you know, all the stuff you're talking about if it was more physical here in the space. So he uh, did an amazing um, help in the project. Uh, so the, the students then went throughout the camp, uh, campus and then also put um, retaking uh, cloths there. So I'm getting to the end to talk about the exhibit. So this is Sesky, and um, it's in an upper middle class neighborhood. I don't remember what happened here. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button and everything moved in the wrong direction. Okay, this is one part of the installation. See, I was given the same space again. <laughs> okay, um, and uh, there was, a, in this one there is a monitor. Uh, this monitor here is of, of, of part of the Flona and the theater performances, and um, the Hetomadas, and the one on the right is of the meeting with the Guarani Mba Reservation uh, close to Sorocaba. Oh, and this also on the monitor, the students explained who the persons were that had been honored. And this is the other side, which is all these tablets that we got that we didn't ask for. Uh, we thought we were gonna do like photocopy language magazines. Uh, and so there are the, uh, the, the language magazines. And here, which you cannot see very well. No, this is the next one, okay. And the idea for me was, um, the students, um, they have a very precarious um, life. Uh, their, their budget, their grant is very tiny. Uh, and I, as young people, they like to come into the city. They come to the city, there's not, uh, it's not a very friendly city. There's not many public spaces uh, and they have to be out in the open. And um, I was nervous for them, so I kept thinking, if I could make um, a link between them and Sesky, in Sesky, there is a, a cafeteria with very good food that's very cheap. Um, there are reasonable people there. Uh, there's an uh, auditorium that could go to events, um, and something could happen. So that was uh, one of the reasons also um, for involving them from the very beginning, and um, to get jobs for them. Uh, so some were hired as guides for my work. Um, and my other idea was also because uh, then we had the audio was to, and we had the speakers and we put them throughout Sasky and we put it in the entrance. This is right at the entrance. So even before you get to Sasky, you hear language, you know? Um, and this was really important to me that this language you hear where it sh should be heard. <laughs> um, and uh, it was in, uh, throughout the Sesky building in the cafeteria, um, the dentist office, because there was, there was a line there, so it's a perfect place for people to have time to hear. And throughout the, the exhibition space, um, 
different places through um, in SESCI. My idea is that gradually we can introduce the concept that SESCI should hire the students for language lessons. So um, I'm um, always trying to figure out how to be able to use the uh, incredible uh, luxury I have of these connections to um, bring a bit of a little bit of a safety net for the situation that is not very possible in Brazil. Uh, these are the students at the opening, and um, some of the students are extremely shy, and, um, but they each spoke at the open. They were very proud of what they did, and they each made an amazing effort to speak. Um, the, oh, the other thing we introduced um, to the, the CCI, which is um, their space in the university, was um, that while decisions are being made, no, uh, nobody who's not an indigenous student can be in the room. So, and it worked beautifully because then now um, they just ask people to leave the space and they ask their uh, non-indigenous professors to leave the space. Uh, and before they were being invaded by these professors. So now there's an, a nice um, protocol that we set up. So this was, um, they decided on, uh, to also retake Sesky. So um, they kept cutting further the blanket. I don't think there's anything left of the blanket much. Uh, and, and also gave these um, uh, uh, honorings to people that were there. Now I continue about how I keep um, working with people. I, um, because I'm now known for doing certain types of work, I'm being asked to uh, tr uh, do a lot of works outside. I've been invited to Mongolia, to Indonesia, all places that I think are super interesting, but I don't want to continue working like this. And I am one artist with an, one assistant that works 10 hours a week. That's, what, that's, my, that's how I work. Um, to expand this is um, not what I'm interested in, so I have to say no to these things. Um, and I want to keep working with um, the communities I already am working with. And um, tomorrow we are doing a workshop. We're gonna be working about a community museum in Mexico that I've been working with since 2009. So I want to keep developing these projects, which is problematic for curators because it's not sexy enough. Uh, and they also do something new, work with the new community, new, 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 no. I mean, uh, I have a responsibility. Once I come in, I have a responsibility. So the next image is Oh, sorry, it's, oh, it went back again. Okay. Okay, so I'm finished now. Yeah. Next image is uh, Rayana uh, Atikun. Uh, she's one of the students, and another student, and that is Tamiqua and Julieta Paredes. I was looking for Julieta Paredes uh, for my work for the Sydney Biennale, and she's a very difficult person to contact. And they sent this image to what? And I said, Rayana, you're standing near Julieta Paredes. Can you get me a way to talk to her, please? So um, uh, she not only got all the information I needed, she goes, why don't we set a meeting, you know, a Skype meeting? So she even organized a Skype meeting. Um, so this was in the month of August, I think? Yeah, July, no July. Tamiqua uh, next to Julieta Paredes. Uh, her mother was killed by uh, an Atlanta takeover. Uh, she was shot. She um, then fled south. She's from the north, Patasho Guarani, Patasho North. She fled south and then founded a reservation. All these amazing young women founding reservation, uh, the Pico de Jaragua Reservation. And she did that when I think she was like 19 or 20 years old while going to university. Um, and this is the last thing I wanted to talk about. This is uh, an image that's in my book. Um, it's a community I was um, working with in 1984. Uh, I'm still dealing with them. And then uh, Caetano, uh, um, I, was, I would always go back and give more and more photos that I had taken because I didn't have money to make all of them. In. And I was giving another new stack to him, but he had died. And then I wanted to give this, the, it's historical, so I wanted to give the photos back. And a cousin of mine found a niece of his and then there was a conference on his niece's beach of mulheres assentadas, indig indigenous, and from other communities. And so I told um, 
the uh, yeah, women students from um, the, my group had gone there and I said, oh, when you're looking at the water, go to a house on the left that's up against the forest and go speak with uh, Neiji. Because she's, uh, uh, she's from that community. She's in a, uh, from 14 years old, she would uh, break fences that people would try to put on the, on the land. And they said, oh, we're camped there. Right? They're actually camped there for the conference. And that's Neiji, uh, who last I knew of was when she was 14. And um, now, uh, this is an organizer from Seski. Uh, Neiji is also um, a, uh, a healer. And she has now been invited by Seski to make a workshop there. Uh, one of the students who was uh, uh, studying environmental ecology from the group, he is now on the 27th, which is what, Sunday? He's, go, uh, he's founded a dance company. And on the 27th, he's presenting it at Seski. He said to Seski, I want to uh, use your auditorium. And they said yes. So um, that's caught up till Sunday on what I'm doing with this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your talk this evening. Um, I just wanted to open up the floor for questions, and I thought I would maybe take advantage of the microphone and start. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about your process of working with communities um, that you aren't necessarily a part of and, and, and how you how you sort of begin that process with this project, but you've, you've spoken about the Decolonizing Brazil project, but uh, as well as others. Um, well, first, as an immigrant, I don't belong to any community, right? So, um, uh, so, um, and, and, the, and yet the community is important to me because I am an immigrant, right? So, so those two situations. So it depends, it, uh, either it is, um, I'm invited to a Biennale and there's a specific context, now that I have a certain fame, I don't. Um, I can say, well, I really want to um, keep working with this community, and I will develop a project with this community. Um, I don't know how long it will last that I can still have that possibility to uh, keep working with s these situations. Um, other times, I just be, uh, I just find a situation, and I, I might be so angry that I decide to look into it, like. Um, the documental work was started in 2009 when I saw a pamphlet from a museum uh, that said what a great job that the, this Spanish guy did of uh, destroying this lake in Mexico. And I, so I went there and then I went to meet with the museum and I said, the community museum, and I said, I'm an artist, I'm, I'm not good at drawing, I'm not good at painting, however, I am very good at these other things and I really want to work with this situation and what uh, do you want me to do with what I can do? So it depends on these things. Are there any other, does anyone have any questions? Open it up. Um, actually, so just continuing on the same theme. Uh, because I think obviously one of the things that's so important in this work is the saying nothing about us without us. And as an artist, it is difficult particularly as you alluded to being an out, the outsider, to convince uh, organizations or funding agencies to fund projects when you don't know what the outcome is gonna be. And you don't even know the, the medium or so on. So it, it's a challenging situation because often even funding agencies that mean well want a, a message, they want a medium, and they won't fund unless you already provide them something, although it's against your principle in a way. Yeah. Just a comment. Um, uh, I've been getting luckier as I get older. <laughs> um, I have now um, curators that know my work very well. Uh, they understand how I work. Uh, for example, the Toronto Biennale. Uh, Candace knows I work very well by being in a place. So they organize an artist in residency and then I just I, I did a lot of work in, in, in it was like two weeks there. I, I came up with five projects. Um, so now I'm, I'm privileged now to be able to um, already have a network of curators that understand how I, I work. 
uh, these producers that I'm working with in Sorocaba, I want to go back and back. I mean, uh, the whole team works super well. And um, if I can get Sesky to support other projects, if the students are interested, I would like to go. Uh, because we get a lot accomplished in a very short amount of time. And if they're to analyze it economically, there's nobody else that could do it. Because <laughs> I'm very fast when um, I begin the work, and the students are super fast. They're much faster than me. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. I guess I just had a, um, from the first project, I've been wondering about the choice, um, the choices made uh, um, for the pots and the way they were placed and the fact that some of them were semi-buried and some of them were in pieces um, and just like where those decisions came from and um, the choice to bring this new object that called back to a tradition and to put them um, to put them in the space like in these different formats or different um, bur buried like different levels of buried because mm -hmm. different levels of buried it had to do with um, uh, the what was in the, in the museum their city museum which was a little bit of shards and some ceramics they had they had found buried so I, I wanted it. Um, buried because the myth of the of the town is that it was found it was one person that did it so that was the myth and I was trying to say no the, the very foundation of this town had nothing to do with this one person so that's why the pots had to be uh, buried I used um, shards sometimes because if an area uh, was a bit rough and I didn't think it was gonna the ceramic pot was gonna last more than a day then I just put the shards in other areas where I thought the, the pots would last then not one pot, I think not one pot was broken, which was, uh, I really think was amazing because there was no security, obviously. Um, and um, they were di put in different uh, ways. Uh, first of all, we had to be very careful with the accumulation of water because of mosquitoes and dengue. Um, so that was one of, some, we had to put it like this because then we could put earth in it and the earth would absorb the water. Um, and plants would grow, so we were trying different things to, to deal with that um, problem. Um, and sometimes it was up more at the university uh, because the students wanted it in buildings and therefore there wasn't a ground to put it in because uh, they wanted it to be visible inside the building. And so it depended on what the needs were. I do not like plans. Kind of push back, or do you get any um, negative? Any kind of push back from? Um, I, I don't know, um, but um, the response from Sasky was good, and um, they are connected to the very elite of the city, and so among the progressive small little community there, uh, there was interest, and so. That was good. I mean, I was quite surprised. I didn't Im imagine that it would work. I would imagine that the pots would all be broken. Um, but it, and then I said, well, then it becomes a sh more of a shard work than a buried pot work. But I had a plan too also. Actually, just to follow on that project, I wondered whether, um, I was curious about what looks like, um, at least to my eyes, somewhat of an archeological motif in that project. Um, and I thought, well, that, it's interesting because obviously um, in working with the um, artisans and sort of in the in a sort of and obviously lost cultural practices and sort of in sort of regaining that knowledge and that practice and I guess I was curious about the decision to in some way when you encounter them in public space to some to encounter them somewhat as a kind of um, a sort of 
cultural legacy that has a certain, let's say, um, resonance with what looks like a kind of archaeological dig, almost like the sort of digging up the past, but mm -hmm. the project was very much rooted in a kind of in insistence on a kind of uh, make, uh, presentness and, and wasn't, so, wasn't really oriented to, towards the past politically in the way that you talked about it. No, it was um, about saying that um, this history is the present. I'm not very much interested in, um, it's because I'm a, I love um, archives and um, I can go very deep, deep, deep into things that are of no interest to anyone else. Um, and so I, I, I figured out that um, Working in a public space, it's very important to um, work with history and the way also I feel that it is the history that is uh, where I am now. You know? And so that history, that history includes all those ceramic pots that we haven't seen. <laughs> um, and uh, that history includes that, those ceramic pots that aren't part of anything now because they aren't produced because for a certain reason. Um, and at the same time, it is um, uh, making us see what is the relationship we actually have with this space and um, with this, this community that's still very visibly there. So I like it when I can um, make this circle um, that the step is all of the things. I'm not very articulate. I went to art school at the moment that was no theory. <laughs> it's been like, oh it's like practice. <laughs> I, I think uh, that was quite articulate. <laughs> um, I want to say, I think if there's no more questions, um, I'm going to say thank you to Maria Teresa so much thank for you. that talk and your answer.